Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for another Zoom edition of ODI Fridays. My name is James and I'm a consultant at the Open Data Institute. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Sue Chadwick. Sue is a strategic planning officer, uh, advisor, sorry, at uh, Pinsent Mason's LLP and one of the ODI's first ever research fellows. Over the last year, Sue has been exploring digital ethics and their implications for planning decisions with a particular focus on human rights, equalities, discrimination and established codes of practice. Today's lecture will explore how government has been making legislation relevant to data and digitalization and how these practices stack up against established codes of digital ethics. Before handing over to Sue, can I please ask that all participants make sure that you continue to have your microphones and cameras off during the presentation. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions at the end, and if you do want to ask something, then please submit your questions using the chat function. And then after the presentation, I'll ask people one by one to unmute and ask their questions. I'd also like to remind you that we are recording this session. Once again, thank you for joining us today, and now I'll hand over to Sue for the presentation. Okay, hello everybody, and a couple of thank yous to start with. Firstly, to the ODI for letting me do this event. I came to the ODI partly through these ODI Fridays. I think they're a brilliant idea to expand the range of what we do into a wider community. And I also wanted to put a special thank you out to everybody who's attending today on a hot Friday to sit and listen to a lawyer talk about legislation and data. So a little bit of an introduction. Um, my background is as a planning solicitor. I'm currently working as a strategic planning advisor at Pinsent Masons. And it's really good to see I've got a couple of colleagues here today as well, looking at the presentation. The last couple of years, I've come, become increasingly interested in digital planning and plan tech. And this has led to um, development of research in how emerging technologies and all of the exciting new developments we're getting alongside, how they sort of impact on established codes of law, um, codes of law that may have been in place for years or even centuries. How do they adapt to all of this new way of thinking and of making decisions? And that in itself has led to a research fellowship with the ODI, focusing on one specific aspect, which is digital ethics in planning decisions. And I'm hoping to publish that research um, later on this year, probably September, if anybody's particularly interested in that as a topic. And maybe it was um, because my work at Pinsent Masons involves a daily review of what's happening in legislation. And maybe it's because of lockdown and I simply had a lot of time on my own at home. But one of the, if you like, one of the cul-de-sacs that came up during this research with the ODI was looking at what the government itself was doing with its legislative powers um, in terms of leg in legislation about data and for digitalization of existing processes. So if you like, I was kind of, taking what I knew about data ethics and turning that as a, a spotlight on the government's own practice in making law. Um, and, uh, as, and Jenny Tennyson, who I've been working with as part of this, thought it would be fun for all of us if I did an ODI Friday on this. Now, I have to say I was quite skeptical about that. There's a, there's a limit to how entertaining it can be talking about data law. But I do think it's an important subject and I hope you will give me the time to see why I think that's the case. So why is it important to look at what the government's doing on data? And the reason for that is that the government has a unique role. Obviously, we all have a role to play in making data ethical, whether that be on our day-to-day -day decisions of accepting privacy settings or not, or whether as an organization, how we share data, how we use data, how we organize data. But only the government can legislate for data. Only the government can say, for example, this is a definition of a high-risk AI system. This is a definition of a privacy breach. This is a definition of digital discrimination. And for that reason, I think it's important that there is scrutiny of the government's function. 
And of course, there are, you know, there are committees and there is the judiciary who have that scrutiny function, but they will tend to scrutinize individual pieces of law or individual governmental decisions. They don't look at the practice of making legislation, which is what I decided to do. So I, what I did over the course of a year was um, look at all of the legislation the government made about data or about the digitalization and said, was the practice of making this legislation ethical? So first of all, what was my data set? Um, and effectively, it was all of the delegated legislation made by the government relevant to the UK in 2020. I simply started on 1st of January and ended on the 31st of December. And it, if I think if I'd known on the 1st of January what a large data set it was, I may have not done the work at all. Because in 2020, the government made 61 primary acts of legislation and 2,437 statutory instruments. Thankfully, only about 1,300 of those were relevant directly to the UK. And that was effectively that the 61 acts and the 1,300 delegated pieces of delegated legislation, that's things like regulations primarily, were my data set. And I did a not very scientific um, sort of that legislation by looking at each and every one each and every morning um, and saying, does this relate to data? Does it relate to information? And does it relate to digitalization of a process? And when it did, I tabulated that and I looked at what it actually did. And over the course of the year, it was able to see that the, the main areas of movement and activity in data fell into specific areas. The first of those obviously was COVID. And what's fascinating for me is that COVID became part of legislation actually on the 27th of January last year, long before we were worried about it. It was added to a list of diseases exempt from front charges for overseas visitors. And that's how it got into legislation very quietly. Um, and then a couple of, and on the 5th of March, it was list, added to the list of notifiable diseases. And that's obviously when the government really got concerned about it. On the 17th of March, the government issued two health directions as statutory de legislation, as delegated legislation, one requiring NHS Digital to share all confidential pa patient health information with other health organizations and the other one giving NHS Digital power to collect and analyze data and share it with non-defined persons or organizations for COVID-19 purposes. I thought that was fascinating because obviously in the last week or so, we've all got really concerned about the default sharing of health records. And this was their practice run. It was, and of course it went by without comment because on the 17th of March, we were much more worried about other things. Um, since then, of course, um, the de default sharing of primary health care records has got as far as the House of Lords, who looked at the question on the 8th of June with the current proposals to do the opt out as a default for everybody with NHS X. And I won't bore you all with the whole of that de debate, but what did come out of it was that the DPIA, the Data Protection Impact Assessment, still hasn't been done for that proposed sharing. In addition to this sharing of health records, there was across the board relaxation of standards. And I think this is one area of really positive lawmaking because things that certainly in my area of law, planning law, things that could only have been done previously by newspaper notices or paper notices or physical deposits of documents overnight transformed into digital records. Um, suddenly everything could be done electronically and all meetings went onto Zoom or Teams or other video sharing platforms. And credit where credit's due, local authorities all over England stepped up, went digital overnight and did a fantastic job. That was a huge positive to come out of COVID. One of the areas that seemed to be more of a concern was the way that the Coronavirus Act was used to increase time limits for retention of DNA. Um, and that's a topic that, that comes up again. Um, 
like it or not, that's one of the things that the Coronavirus Act was used for. Um, and then, of course, the obligations that we're all familiar with over the year for various bodies to collect and disclose information, including every single one of us when we go into premises, including information from premises themselves, information of um, from, from employees to share information with employers, all kinds of obligations that we would never even have dreamed of accepting a year ago were imposed as a result of COVID. The second really large area where there was massive digitalization was environment. And when I say that, I mean the wide environment, not just the subnatural environment, but the, the infrastructure. So a new street manager service was, in, was um, set up for all street works and they've effectively created a digital platform for all street work services, which they are currently extending at the moment. Um, I think, again, this is a really positive thing. I love, I like the way that the government's exploring platform based services for what used to be done through an enormous amount of red tape and bureaucracy. Um, lots of new data sharing requirements. I think this one's a really interesting one. Because, as we all know, there are lots of tech startups that, particularly for travel, um, look to create value from sharing data, monetizing data sharing. And I think there's a real, um, the, the government is sort of not exactly undermining this, but by requiring details of things like bus services to be disclosed very widely, it is setting up its own um, facilitation of shared data, which would be very useful for things like um, smart cities. This is one area where I think things are really positive again, that the government's just stepping in and saying, you know what, this doesn't work. We need to make sure this data gets shared. You must share it. One example of that taken to quite an extreme level was the Agriculture Act, passed in November last year, gave there's powers between sections 23 and 26, which define the agri-food supply chain. And it's literally everything from the seed in the ground through to the food being delivered by a supermarket to your door. And every, anyone in that chain or connected to that chain, there is now a, a power for the government. It hasn't been implemented yet, but the government has a power to require disclosure of information about that food supply chain. Um, and it can use that power of disclosure on anyone connected to the chain for a very wide range of purposes, which aren't just sort of an environmental good, but things like productivity and, and market analysis. So very wide data sharing powers in there. Um, in addition, there was the next area, which was Brexit, of course. Of course, Brexit was a massive area for um, information related powers. And this one was one where there was less than I was expecting because most of the legislation was simply there to make sure that everything we were already doing with data sharing as part of being part of the EU would continue once we were out of the EU. And most of it um, for very good purposes, such as sharing and storing criminal records, sharing and storing information about passengers and vehicles, and also some information disclosure on financial sanctions and maintaining protections on food, plant and health products. So Brexit, which I was expecting to be a rich area of data sharing, wasn't, whereas the environment was actually a very rich area where information was, the government used its powers to do things with information and data. And then the fourth area was digitalization. So I looked at all of the areas where the government has used its powers to require things to go digital. And a lot of this, as I mentioned before, was relevant to COVID because everything had to go electronic. One of the most disappointing areas in this um, from my profession is that having made everybody go digital and go onto video related platforms for things like meetings, the government failed to make that change permanent. So now all local authority meetings are mandated as physical only. So if we do go into a lockdown or even fail to come out of the current one, there is a real democratization problem there because they cannot have these meetings online anymore. And it has, 
it has closed down access for a number of different um, body, uh, a number of different age groups um, and people who couldn't get to meetings because they were uh, had different obligations. All of those wonderful developments have been scaled back. Um, Lots of processes have stayed digital, things like service of documents, posting notices and depositing papers, which is positive. The Healthy Start scheme was entirely digitalized. And I thought that was an interesting choice because we all know that digital um, exclusion is highly correlated with poverty. And the Healthy Start scheme is also highly correlated with poverty. So it's, I questioned why that was the scheme that went digital when it, the people who were most likely to use it were also less likely to have digital skills and digital accessibility. And then the one that really made me smile, um, clearly the government really got, got um, fed up with GP practices not going digital and it passed regulations um, about halfway through the year requiring them to stop using fax machines. And that's a kind of sad reflection on the NHS that that had to be done altogether. So that was my data set. It's not perfect, but it's it's an interesting one if you're interested either in legislation or data. The second one was really, what are ethical standards? And that's a, a really interesting question. The ODI definition of ethics is a branch of ethics that evaluates data practices. Data ethics relates to good practice around how data is collected, used and shared. And that's a lovely phrase because it's open, it's flexible, but I wouldn't want to enforce it. It's not a great legal definition. And that's the problem. How do you, how do you evaluate ethics if you haven't got something to evaluate it against? And so I had to go out there and get my own criteria, if you like, from ethics. And anybody here who's dealt with ethics knows there's a different ethical standard almost for every day of the year. And they're coming out nationally, internationally, in the EU all the time. Um, so the ones I chose were a select bunch. I looked at the national data strategy because it is the national data strategy. And because it's an active document, the government's just published its response to the consultation. I looked at the, the data ethics framework, again, because it's our national um, document and it was updated in September 2020, so it's nice and relevant as well. Obviously, I looked at the data ethics canvas because it's a brilliant tool. It's got so many different criteria for assessing what ethics are, and it's not just criteria, it's practice and criteria in one, in one document. So obviously, that was a source tool as well. Because my background is property, I also use the real estate data or the RED Foundation principles of data ethics, because so far they are the only significant property institution to create freestanding data ethics principles. Um, and because they are six relatively simple principles. And then I use the Nolan principles, and I'm guessing that many of you won't even have heard of these. Um, they are the principles of behaviour in public life that were put together by the Committee on Standards in Public Life back in the 1990s. And the reason I chose them was because when there is an ethical complaint about conduct in government, whether it be the Prime Minister or um, the person on the desk in the local leisure centre, it goes all the way through government. It is the Nolan principles of conduct in public life that are applied. And I noticed that today the National Data Guardian put out a, um, a blog post about her role in the recent debate about NHS data sharing. And she referred to the Nolan principles as one of her guiding compasses for making decisions. So they are relevant to ethics. They, they were made in a time before we all went digital, but they're very relevant to government practice. And from all of those um, different standards, I then narrowed it down to three principles because they were the principles that were consistent throughout. Firstly, transparency not just on what is being done, but on how it's being done and what will be done next. 
that is in all of the um, selected standards. So the national data strategy says there must be a transparent practice. Data ethics framework has transparency as a principle. The Red Foundation has transparency as a principle. And the Nolan principles have accountability as well. I also chose compliance because it is really where the law comes in and because it is also in um, the national data strategy, predictable legal framework, um, the ethics, the data ethics canvas of the ODI mentions the need to take legislation into account. Um, and the Red Foundation also says that data, data ethics should be lawful. And then I added my own, and this is really important, at least I think so because consistency is so important when it comes to ethics and none of the standards recognize it. And why it's important is because of the way English law is. Partly we deal with statute, statutes and legislation, but partly we have what's called common law principles where law is formed from practice of case law so if I wanted to take the government to task for unethical practice and I couldn't find a definition of ethics, I would need to show that the government was breaching its own established standards. And if you don't have consistency, then what you have is a kind of passive embedding of poor practice. And the government can turn around and say, Hmm. you say what I'm doing is unethical, but I did it here and I did it here and I did it here and there was no problem with it then. So I would, we, the government would say this is accepted practice and you have no legal right to challenge that. And I'm guessing that in most cases where there is precedent for poor practice, it is much harder to then go to the courts and say, we want you to do something about poor practice. So I added consistency. And then I took those standards and I took my data set and I said, OK, what what how well did the government do in 2020 taking this data set and applying those standards? Transparency is recorded as a core value in all the sources. And I would say that the legislation.co.uk website is um, an exemplar of transparency. It's a very big database, it's very easily searchable, um, and it's really clear what is there, what is not there, and it's updated every day, um, relentlessly updated every day. I used to, um, I used to, obviously I checked it every day and it, my heart would sink when it was sort of 11 statutory instruments made today. Uh, especially when it got to Brexit and we were doing 24 a day, but it's a brilliantly transparent website. However, the way that the practice of legislation was made, was made was deficient. Consultation was not always carried out. And when it wasn't carried out, it was very poorly justified. For example, in January last year, we made regulations facilitating cooperation with Chinese co companies on audits and investigation. There was no consultation on that legislation. And the lack of consultation was justified because of a need to minimize sensitivities in advance of negotiations with the EU. I would say that's a really poor reason. That's a reason to consult, not to avoid consultation. Um, in June 2020, I'm going to go back now to the, the, the postponement of, of destruction of DNA. Um, we made regulations postponing the destruction of DNA evidence that was otherwise required by law to 31st of October 2022. And again, there was no consultation for that. Um, and the justification for the lack of consultation was that there was significant investigative date value in the data. And again, I would say that's a reason to consult, not to avoid consultation. And there is a, um, there's a, a body called the Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee. I know it's not the most um, fun sounding body, but they do a really valuable job of looking at all the legislation governments made and saying when they think there were deficiencies. And there were criticisms by that committee 
of deficiencies in consultation, not in the two examples that I've mentioned, but actually in some of the planning legislation that was passed that year. So I'm not the only one going, hmm, there was a bit of a problem here with transparency over the year. Compliance. You would assume that the government would be compliance with basic legal principles and, and conventions in its making of data. And compliance is recognized in all of the print, all of the standards that I've identified. But again, there were defects in 2020. For example, um, sometimes the house wasn't given the usual notice that it is given that law wasn't coming into effect. Sometimes things were implemented um, without the proper warning. Um, there were some regulations that were actually amended because of doubtful virays. The, 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 the scrutiny committee wasn't even sure that they had the power. And then emergency measures in the Coronavirus Act were actually removed because the Joint Committee on Human Rights, again, another committee from Parliament, ruled that they would reduce the safeguards under Article 5 of the Human Rights Act. So really quite significant legal defects. And on information management alone, um, there was a, a little bit of a flurry of scandal last year when the police force um, de deleted a whole load of data and got basically got their record keeping wrong. So 213 offence records um, and arrest records were either wrongly deleted or retained when they shouldn't have been. And in addition, the Conservative Party itself has just been fined £10,000 for sending unlawful emails. So there's been a few er errors, real legal errors by the government in the way it deals with legislative data, but, but also you know, basic data compliance as well. And then finally, consistency. And this was the one I got really wound up about um, silently in my, in my living room over the kitchen table. Um, I found the government's practice annoyingly inconsistent in the way that it messed around with the powers that it had made. So obviously the Coronavirus Act made lots of new powers and the government extended some of these powers, quite a few of these powers, in completely different ways. Some of them were extended for six months, some for 12 months, some for 18 months. Some were sp extended to specific dates and some were not. Some of the dates were reviewable and some were not. And you, know, you could obviously, in some ways, you could say, why are you getting worried about something like that? But what I would say is it sets up a precedent of really poor practice in ethical treatment of data and legislation. And then the standard practice, if you're making legislation, is to accompany it with an explanatory memorandum, which is a God-given resource for those of us who find wading through legislation difficult. It's a nice, clear explanation in every case of the policy background, the reason the legislation was made, whether or not an equalities impact was carried out, whether or not an impact assessment was carried out. Quite a lot of legislation, particularly towards the end of the year, it, there was a kind of mission creep, didn't have these explanatory memoranda. There was no reason why there was no explanatory memoranda. Sometimes there was an explanatory memoranda, but there was no EQIA, there was no IA. And again, there was no justification for the inconsistency. And it was that erosion of standards that I think maybe only lawyers get really upset about, but I found myself getting quite upset about um, my own personal outrage. But I think the risk when it comes to data practice is that actually we don't have that much law at the moment. We don't have that much law on data and we have nothing at the moment on AI. And if you have inconsistency and some deficiencies, you're setting up bad practice from the start. So my conclusions are that ethics, unfortunately, are not fixed. They fluctuate with changes. They, they fluctuate with changes in policy, in public life, and in pu with public norms. We can get better, but we can get worse as well. And I know I was ready in, May, in March for the government really to take whatever power it needed to, to keep us all safe. 
And it was a lesson, I think, for all of us that in, in an uncertain world, we will trade our ethical safeguards to feel safe. COVID provided a very friendly environment for the decline of standards and agreed the government had a very difficult job to do and some it was justified in some corner cutting. My worry is that this corner cutting is something that's now become normal practice. Um, and I would just say thank you all for listening. And I hope we've got some questions and some observations, um, particularly as I'm speaking to a, a, a community of people who are not lawyers. Um, and I'm, I really want to sort of spread the word that this is sometimes where power is used. And if in nothing else, to, to, to make us all a bit more aware of that. So I'm going to stop sharing now and go back to normal size head and I'll be really, really interested to hear if anybody's got questions or um, issues or comments. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Sue, um, for I think what was a very fascinating presentation. That might just be me coming from a data perspective, but, um, but I really do think that was interesting. Um, I will kick us off with questions. Um, I have one for you, um, and it might be a bit of a um, it might be a bit of a controversial one, maybe. Um, but who do you think needs to take ownership for what might be perceived as failures around data and digital ethics? And do you think that they're already well equipped to do so? Um, well, the failures. I mean, I suppose when you get to government and public sector, failure gets tossed around like a football. Um, the, the responsibility lies with the government um, because it was charged with the power, it is charged with the power to make legislation. It also rests with parliament because they are the bodies that can scrutinize legislation. Um, the House of Lords this week decided not to, um, they could have blocked delegated legislation that was made, I think, quite poorly. There's been very controversial. They decided not to. So government and pol parliament have the power. But as individuals, we have the power to lobby our MPs and to keep an eye on legislation to see what's being made. Um, so legislation goes, this sort of responsibility goes all the way through. And of course, you know, the ODI, Ada Lovelace, the Turing, they all, we all share that responsibility. And it's, you know, it can be quite dull because you need to sift through the legislation. Um, but what we can also do is set standards and keep them. And that in itself sets up a policy of good practice that can be asserted if we want to challenge bad practice. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Joan Grant, would you like to ask your question? I will. Um, earlier, fairly early on in the presentation, the speaker mentioned about an area where um, I think like an impact assessment should have been done and hasn't been done. I wondered if she could say a bit more about that. Yeah, let me find the slide. Um, yes, it was the... Um, it was that one on the the Chinese the Chinese um, cooperation. That one didn't have an impact assessment. Um, the biometric, the retention of biometrics, didn't have an impact assessment. Um, I'm just trying to find the other uh, slide as well. Um, yeah. Okay. And there was also um, requirements on disclosure of public health information published without an impact assessment as well. I think that was the one that got me wound up a little bit. It's statutory instrument 1090. Um, and it was regulations requiring the disclosure of public health information. They were published without an impact assessment. And it simply said, due to the urgent nature of this instrument, and I'm not sure that um, that actually justifies an impact assessment. It's a bit like the, the data sharing without the DPIA being required, or it's still quite vague when it'll be disclosed. It's, 
sometimes you can justify not having an impact assessment, but I, I don't think it's good enough to just say due to the urgent nature of the instrument. Um, I don't think it would, they would get away with that in local governments, so why should national government get away with it? Brilliant, thanks Sue. Um, we have a question from Louise. Louise, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I just, um, I'm just interested in um, regulatory systems, which I know encompasses a whole plethora of things, um, but I was just wanting to hear from you what you think needs to be done next, you know, what the next steps ideally mm. would be to make sure that um, things are changed in, in the right way that people are consulted. Yeah, this is very much my personal view, but... <sighs> I would like to see, at the moment, when you have an explanatory memoranda for a, for a statutory instrument, it's quite clearly a template. And that template has standard headings that include things like impact assessment, human rights compliance, policy background. I would like to see a heading added to that template that said digital impacts and, and explicit, and they would then they, would, they could easily say there are no digital, impact, digital impacts but at least it would force the question to be asked. And I would also like it to be non-avoidable to have that explanatory memorandum because they're so useful and they, they're just rigorous. That's that, you know, you know how it is with regulatory systems. Once you've got something locked in, it's like, it's like automating any process. You simply can't pass that step without doing what you're meant to do. And digital impacts, are becoming more and more important in every context, particularly legislative, if the government is forced to consider them. And of course, including digital exclusion and digital accessibility. I think the law around information and data would improve and would become more transparent. That's great. Thank you very much. We, um, I work for a charity, so our due diligence checklists are a really integral part of our, yeah. of our government's process and what we do. So I'm quite surprised that these these memorandum aren't, you know, standard sorry, compulsory. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Mark, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, I was I was just going to ask um, where where did you is there a website that has a list of um, like data related government? policies either official government ones or or, a, or like a, a private sector one that actually like lists all the data relate ones that relate to data no it's a bit of a i mean you know that would be another thing the government could do so i go to a number of different sources every day i look at the obviously i look at the government digital service which is one aspect of government i look at the center for um digital ethics and innovation every day I look at the cabinet office every day and I look at the Department for Culture, Media and Sport every day because they all do different things about data at different times. And then I also check the Turing and the Ada Lovelace and the ODI um, and the ICO. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing most people on this call would say we could really do with a central source of data information. I'd be, I'd be really interested to see what the, what the general um, view is on that one actually. I think I'd agree with you there, definitely on there, some kind of central source to bring yeah, them all yeah. together. You have to, you have to hunt, hunt around for a bit. But <laughs> I know, you do. You do. You mentioned, some, you mentioned something on the news and yeah, and they'll talk about it, but actually where it's actually located, and it, it can be a bit of a hunt to try and, yeah. to, try to find Hansard out. Hansard is great, but it's not as accessible as that legislation website that I mentioned. And you, and again, I check Hansard every day. And again, you know, I, 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 it is an enormous, I, I think my partner's listening in on this and I do, you know, want to say how patient he was over the, particularly over New Year last year when everybody else was out partying and I was like <laughs> watching the legislation because it just, you know, not everybody has that amount of time or um, nerdiness um, and it shouldn't be that, it shouldn't be that difficult. Okay, what did you say? What website did you say? Hansard there. Hansard, yeah. It's it's Hansard. the daily record of everything that went on in Parliament the previous day. Oh, right. Hans, Hansard, the Centre yeah. for Digital Ethics. Love, yes. love, Lovelace, did you say? The Ada Lovelace Institute. Oh, the, oh yeah, Ada, yeah. Ada Lovelace, the ICO and the, the Turing yeah. Institute. The Turing, yeah. yeah. Turing, Turing Institute. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, Wayne, would you like to ask your question? 
Okay, you, you may have partially answered this before while I was typing the question, but one can understand that during the, the uh, panic of the early parts of the pandemic, that the House of Lords scrutiny might have been reduced. But now is it exerting more scrutiny on the new legislation and reviewing this existing legislation to see if it's mm -hmm. still justified? Um, one of the heroic things I think about the House of Lords was the way that they were absolutely not disrupted by anything during COVID. Um, I remember when it went digital because I do check Hansard every day and the, um, the, the record of Hansard began with can all members remember to mute the group chat function? It was kind of this is the point that we all go digital when the House of Lords um, and when and there are some hilarious Hansard bits um, in March last year when members are, you know, tr struggling to access Zoom and not knowing how to what the mute function is. But no, the, everything continued just as it was. And the legislative, the, the particular committee that I was interested in is the Legislation Scrutiny Committee. The House of Lords has one, but there's also another one that is a joint function of the House of Lords and the House of Commons. They churned out report after report after report, and a number of them were critical of the way the government made various bits of legislation. I don't know whether they were more critical this year or last. I only looked at the ones that looked at data and criticised the way data was 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 used in legislation or made in legislation um so th really that's not better or worse than it was during covid it is exactly the same as it was and uh, hats off to that scrutiny committee for keeping the good work going the issue is not everybody reads those reports um and it's maybe you know maybe we should all start checking them a little bit more because that's where the scrutiny is happening and there's not many other areas where the scrutiny now Okay, thank you. Uh, good talk, by the way. Thank you. Great. And uh, Mohammed, would you like to ask your question? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, hi. Thank you for this a great session. Uh, regard uh, my my, uh, my question, I want to ask regarding from from your experience. We have uh, other trends on on the technologies and how how we use it properly. So I mean by here by the artificial intelligence is, as you all know, it's increasingly uh, permeates every aspect of our society. And uh, they can, uh, AI including uh, uh, embodies AI in, in, in robotics and, uh, and techniques like machine learning can enhance our economy, society, welfare, and an exercise of, of a human rights as well. But at the same time, uh, artificial intelligence may be misused on, on behave in an unpredicted and potentially harmful way. So a question on, from your experience, a question on, on the role of law, uh, ethics and technology on, on, on governing AI, uh, on governing AI systems and thus more relevant than, than ever before. Mm -hmm. So as you, as you said that, we can on 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 data ethics, so that we can we can have a type of good practice on uh, on on, ha on uh, let's say uh, gather and use and then share the data. So what about the technology on this uh, yeah. on this aspect? Mohammed, that's a brilliant question, and I know now that there's at least one person that's going to read my report because I look at AI in two sections. It's very relevant to planning, but of course it's a pervasive technology, so it's relevant to AI generally. I look at it firstly in terms of um, digital exclusion and opacity of decision making. I think now that we are using advanced uh, AI technology with black box or non-interpretable algorithms, when AI is used in public functions, I think we're getting close to the point where all public bodies should be making transparent decisions about the use of AI, or they will be making other decisions about things like healthcare policy that are informed by AI. And I think there's going to be a real legal issue about how transparent a decision is if perhaps the judgment has been based on an algorithmic output that was non-transparent. So that's one big area of AI and, and my concern. The other one, which is the one you're, you're more uh, 
you're, I think that you're more talking about is AI and equalities and human rights. And there's two issues there. The first one is, I think, AI used to, in coordination with biometric sensory technology, where the sensory technology scrapes the biometric information and then the AI manipulates it into an outcome um, or, you know, or, or scans it against a database. I think that can be very beneficial, but it can also be deeply harmful, especially as we know that things like facial recognition technology are still deficient when it comes to um, recognizing um, ethnicities in faces, recognizing gender in faces. It is simply not as good as distinguishing female faces uh, or, or any faces other than, than you know, white men. And that, that is a huge problem when it comes to equalities and the use of a advanced AI with sensory technology. Um, but the other issue with AI is intrusion, plain and simple. Um, and that's when Article 8 of the Human Rights Act and the need for to protect private life is increasingly infringed, particularly by um, surveillance technologies and again, facial recognition. So yes, there's issues and the responses are very interesting because we have quite a, a wide gap now between, the, between Europe where they have actually published uh, an EU statute with a draft definition of AI technology, with um, a classification of risk levels of technologies um, and with various ways of ensuring that technology is well used. But in England, we have an AI strategy emerging, which there's currently a consultation being run by the Turing Institute which closes on the 20th of June. So I'd, I'd encourage everybody to put something in on that. Um, in, a, in the only other guidance we have that I can see about AI is three blog posts from the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation, which promote AI assurance. And um, then very, very good guidance on AI and explainability of algorithms from the ICO and the Turing Institute and really good guidance again from the Ada Lovelace. What we don't really have is government guidance on this and hopefully the AI strategy will provide that. But at the moment, it's just in consultation form. So yeah, a really interesting area that one. And I'm hoping to do some research on that next actually. Thank you, and that uh, uh, it was good talk for that. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks for your question, Mohammed. And uh, lastly, Ben, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Yes. Um, I mean, I I think more and more decisions are going to be made on data. One thing that particularly strikes me is we're all now going to have local industrial strategies, and you know that's great, and there's lots of local data that could inform those, but but only if. If, I mean, as far as I know, there's very little guidance being given to LEPs and combined authorities on how you use that data. So, and that's about deciding, you know, who gets, who, whose jobs are supported and who aren't, um, you know, at a local level. I, I just wonder, you know, how, how do we, do we push for like more transparency, not just keeping levels of transparency of the past, but actually as data applications get more complex, actually to push for higher levels of transparency, you know, what, what are the ways to go about this? Yeah, that's then that's a great shirt and that's a great question. Um, <laughs> um, I think there's a real opportunity if you're working in a public sector environment to take the high road. And if you're thinking about using AI or data in a new way, just to either draft a policy or have a decision to do it, have a public decision to do it, well, you know, you will have you will have minutes of meetings, you'll have, you'll have, whether you're a, a public authority or a, an entity that's working in the public sector, you have the opportunity to say, we are going to use this data for this purpose and apply these analytics. We know there are these risks associated with it, including the loss of jobs. We know there are these benefits associated with it, including potential job creation. 
and we are going to make a human judgment about that, which is one of the one of the things that computers are very far away from doing is exercising that human judgment and make that a transparent decision, a transparent, reasoned, justified decision. It's sort of managing upwards in, in a sense. Um, but I think there's a real opportunity to, to just do that, whether or not it's required in law, because it starts to create a, 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 a what I would call a, a, a um, a community of good practice and then when you've done it share it and say we did this would anybody like the template of the decision and start to then become not just a community of good practice but a community of consistent good practice there are so many people out there who want to do this well I think there's a real opportunity to generate our own good practice good documents brilliant uh, thank you, Ben, for the question, and thank you, everyone, uh, for so many good questions. Um, we have such a good turnout today, and uh, I think, Sue, you must be surprised. Yeah, I am. <laughs> um, so, so once again, thank you, Sue, um, for your presentation today. I, I think it's been really great um, and very interesting. Um, we look forward to hopefully seeing some of our audience next week at our next Friday lunchtime lecture, where we will hear from artist AM Dark. So it'll be a very different type of, uh, of, of conversation, I think, there. Um, uh, AM Dark will be discussing the process of developing Fairly Intelligent, which is a speculative fiction about the world's worst algorithm posing as the world's best algorithm, which should be really interesting. So uh, once again, thank you, everyone, uh, and I hope you have a good rest of the day and weekend.